to God be the glory. Let's all stand and sing that together. Song 259, to God be the glory. Great things he hath done in our lives as he saved us from death and sin and hell and the grave. Let's lift it up today. To God be the glory. I'm going to have him lead us in that first verse again as we sing it to God be the glory. And think about this, great things he hath done. And uh, just as a kickoff for our service, so loved he the world that he gave us his son. Let's think about these words as we sing, and then I'll come back up and we'll pray and open the service. To God be the glory. obeyed a biblical command there because the Bible says, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. It's good to see each of you this morning. Thank you for being in church. If you're uh, joining us via live stream, thank you so much for that. And if you're listening on the radio, this is Buffalo Ridge Baptist Church right here in Gray, Tennessee. We're certainly thankful that you've joined us, however you've come to be with us today. And we're looking forward to a great, great day. And um, I believe Miss Cersei up here is your birthday today. Praise the Lord. That's what Brother Joe said. 90, uh, she doesn't mind me saying, how, how old? Brother Joe, what did you say? 94. Praise. Amen. Praise the Lord. 
Amen. Now, listen, I'm not dumb. If a lady was 34, 44, 54, I would never ask. So, uh, but Miss Christina, she doesn't mind. And so thank the Lord for that. And uh, what a joy. Thank you for being in church today. We're looking forward to a good time in the house of the Lord. As we open up in prayer, why don't you please pray for Brother David Harrison. He usually sits right there about where Tim Wood is right behind. He's been here for uh, the last six, eight, ten weeks. I don't know. He's been uh, joining us and uh, he was, he's battling cancer. But he's doing well with that, but he's having some heart issues. He's over at Holston Valley, so I want you to be lifting Brother David Harrison up. He's an evangelist, a good brother in Christ, and we certainly want to ask the Lord's blessings. And then we're also praying for Brother Bob Smith. He got moved from Holston Valley, thank the Lord, down to NHC in Johnson City. So that's a step in the right direction. We need to get him there and get some therapy, rehab, get him stronger and get him home. So please keep Brother Bob in your prayers, if you would, please. And then we're praying for Edith Rourke. She's uh, taking those treatments. Praying for Brother Lynn Anderson. He's taking treatments as well. And continue to pray for Miss Sharon Harmon. Uh, Craig, her and Craig probably watching us today. And we want to keep them lifted up in prayer. And uh, we're just certainly blessed that we have a God to go to. So as I open up in prayer, wouldn't you join me? And we'll ask the Lord's blessings. And then ask Him to meet with these folks as well. Lord, we thank You for the chance to be back in Your house. I pray that You would meet with us in a special way. Lord, we're already gathered. We're here. Uh, Lord, you've allowed us to be here on this beautiful day. I pray that you would just do a sincere work in everyone's heart. And then, dear Lord, we do pray for Brother David Harrison over at the hospital. You'd strengthen him, and he's going to be taking some tests today. And the uh, Lord, pray that stress tests and things that he's got, that that would give some indication of what the next step is the doctors need to take. Bless him. Bless Brother Bob down at NHC. Give this week of good therapy and rehabilitation, dear Lord. Just strengthen him, we ask. And we'll certainly thank you for that. Bless Miss Edith. Bless Miss Judy. And uh, Lord, bless Sharon Harmon as well. And we pray for Bob Daniels. And we've got so many, but we, Lord, just ask you to continue to strengthen these folks. And we will certainly give you the glory for all that happens. Bless us now, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Brother Daniel is going to come in just a little bit and give us a, lead us another song or two, but I want to give you a couple of announcements. We'll keep them short. Uh, next Sunday at 10 o'clock, Amy and I will be meeting with some folks who'd like to know more about joining Buffalo Ridge Baptist Church. We have a beautiful ministry house just right across the street, right, right there out that window just across uh, the street there. We'll be meeting there at 10, the Sunday school hour before this one. And if you'd like to come, there's a sign-up sheet in the back. Amy and I will be there at the end of service. And uh, we just love to have you and your family come just to get more information about the church and and we'll have a good time of fellowship and some snacks and things. That'll be next week at 10. And then uh, tomorrow night, uh, Brother Paul Pritchard will be back in town. You know, he's moved over to Nashville area, but there's a fellowship that's honoring him. 7 p.m. here at the church. If you'd like to come, we'd certainly invite you to be here. We'll have a, a good service. His son, uh, Paul Jr., will be preaching for us and uh, just have a good time together. And then in the lobby, there's a VBS, Vacation Bible School. It's coming quick. Uh, some volunteer forms, and they are in the lobby out on that table. If you wouldn't mind, if you'd like to help with Bible school, sign that, and uh, you can turn into an usher, turn into one of the staff. Any of us will get it to the right place, but uh, we're looking forward to Bible school and love to have you part of it. And uh, then May 4th, next Saturday, we have outreach breakfast. So at 930 over the Family Life Center, if you can come, eat a good breakfast with us. And then we'll go out. Some of us will visit bus routes and Sunday school classes or visit shut-ins, visit folks who haven't been here for a while. And uh, we'll find a place for you if you'd like to come. We would certainly enjoy having you. Well, I wanted to give one last announcement and invite you back tonight. Of course, we'll have a Bible study. Or we'll preach, rather, through First Peter. And, uh, but also, I want to share a little bit with the church family about uh, some exciting things we want to do, updating some areas down this way. And you say, Pastor, that sounds expensive. You got it right. It is. But so is everything. It's your house, this house, wherever it is. But uh, it's a blessing. We've got some things I'd like to present to you. Uh, we'll have a short just business meeting at the end of the service and give you a couple of ideas of what we can do, I believe, to make this facility even better for the Lord's glory, just to see many folks come in. And so that'll be this evening. Also this evening, we'll have a update about our UK trip. The teens are going later this year. Just Well, actually later, not very much later. Uh, here a few weeks, going to the United Kingdom. And uh, many of you have been so gracious to help with that, but others have asked how much more do they have left on that. We'll give an update about what the fundraising, where that's at, and so that'll be a few things going on tonight. So that's enough of the announcements. I want you to stand with us, if you're able to, one more time before the service gets into the preaching time, but we're going to sing hymn number 133, Hallelujah, What a Savior.
Well, it's time to get together as well. I'm going to ask one of our ushers if they wouldn't mind praying, asking the Lord's blessing on us. Brother Rick Hall, also an usher and a deacon, uh, going to pray and ask the Lord's blessings on us. Father, we thank you for this time to be in your house. Help us, Father, as we listen to the message that you'll touch our hearts, bring us closer to you. We thank you, Father, that we do have a Savior. And as, and, uh, as each day goes by, we should exalt him and be the example we need to be. Go with us now through this offering in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. You can remain seated. We'll sing song 641. All that thrills my soul is Jesus. I hope you can look to him this morning and just think how much Jesus means to you as we sing this song.
Jesus walked upon the water. He stilled the storm and calmed the angry sea. With his hands he healed the leper. He made the lame to walk, the blind to see. He fed thousands of people with a few loaves of bread. And when the ruler's daughter died, he raised her from the dead. Jesus is a God of miracles. Nothing is at all impossible to him. But I know this, of all his miracles, the most incredible must be the miracle that rescues me. Jesus bled and died to save me, a price that I could never pay alone. When he rose again, he gave me the greatest gift the world has ever known. Oh, I can be time I turn to him and someday he will lift me up to live with him Jesus is a God of miracles nothing is at all impossible to him but I know beside me and heal my wounds and calm my troubled heart always there to bless and guide me oh, my psalm at night my bright and morning star his love and grace will never each day they start anew. My name is graven on his hands, and yours is too. Jesus is a God of miracles. Nothing is at all impossible to him, but I Amen. Thank you, Brother Daniel, Miss Becca, for that. What a joy, the wonderful miracle that rescues, rescued me. 
And thank God for that. Well, I wanted to just tell you men, thank you for many of you came out to the prayer breakfast yesterday. Brother Archie Johnson uh, headed that up, and we're so thankful. We had a good time. We'll have, again, we'll have one again in the fall, and we're going to design it so we can have you bring some men that uh, might come with you. But if you came yesterday, we did have a, a gift for you, and we forgot to give that out. But Brother Archie Johnson, if you'd see him, he's got it today. You can get that. But thank you for being a part of that. Well, I want you to look in your Bibles, if you would, to John chapter number 10. We're going to look at John chapter number 10, verse 9, 10, 11, somewhere right through there. While you're finding your place in John 10, I did hear this story about this little girl. She wanted to ask her parents about the origins and where they came from and all that stuff. And so she went to her dad, said, Dad, where did we come from? He said, well, what do you mean we moved from Ohio? He said, no, I don't mean that. Where did we come from? She said, well, from that, I guess, England. He said, no, 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 long for that. Where did all men, all, all of us come from? He said, oh, okay. He said, well, he said, billions and billions of years ago, uh, there was some, some kind of sales, and we went into monkeys and orangutans and apes and all of this, and then eventually just got down, lost our tail, put on clothes, and here we are. She said, I don't think that's right. And uh, so she went to her mom and said, Mom, where did we come from? She said, he, she said, saying, well, we came from Ohio. I said, no, I don't mean that. Where did we come from before that? I said, all my folks came from Germany. And this. Said, I don't mean that. Where did we come from? Where did all of us come from? And she said, oh, you mean that? I said, well... About six or 10,000 years ago, God created Adam and Eve, created them, put them in the garden, gave them the, the garden to tend to, and then you can look through the Scriptures, you can find all of the lineage of everybody and come down to uh, where we are now. And so you can look to Jesus' time, and then, and then you can trace ancestry. You say, oh, good. She said, well, I don't understand. She said, that sounds right. That's what I've heard. That's what I thought was right. But she said, Dad said that came from monkeys and apes and all that. She said, oh. She said, I was telling you about my side of the family. <laughs> Can't be responsible for his. So. Well, we're looking at John chapter 10, verse number 9. The Bible says, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and, go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I'm not preaching on that, but, you know, the thief is doing an awfully good job right now to come in to steal and to kill and to destroy all things that are good and holy and right and righteous in your life, in your family, in our homes, in our country. But Jesus says, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. I'm going to stop there, and we'll look down at verse 14, 15, some later, but I want to stop there for this. I want to preach for a little while about the Good Shepherd. We have this wonderful passage about that. An actor was somewhere, and he was giving his, an exhibition of his oratory skills. It was years ago, and he would quote poems or he'd read poems. He was just giving requests or taking requests. He had such an eloquent voice. It was just a small setting. And after some displays, uh, an old fellow asked him if he would recite or read the uh, 23rd Psalm. And so he said, I know it, I can, I can do that. And so he recited, it was with great inflection, he was a trained professional, his voice was good, he had the pauses all in the right spot. And when he got done, people clapped and they were very appreciative of what he'd done. But as the old man asked him to recite it or, or read it, he said, on one, one condition, you have to do it as well after I'm done. And so the old man agreed. Well, when the professional actor got done, then the old man with a raspy voice that wasn't very eloquent, he was a little spotty in his, <clears throat> his uh, oratory skills, I guess, but he got teared up as he was reading, or he's quoting it rather. And uh, the people just started crying. Well, they went on for the rest of the evening. And so afterwards, some people were gathered around the actor who was famous of the time. And they said, we don't understand. Said, you did such a masterful job. But really, it seemed that the people enjoyed the old man that didn't have anything impressive about him. Said, how do you account for that? And the actress, actor said, I know the psalm. But he said, the old man must know the shepherd in the psalm. And I'm afraid sometimes we've gotten so professional in all of our lives that we're forgetting who the shepherd is. Back in these days that 
the original readers would have been as, the, as God gave the word to the people there. They would have been in this Palestinian area, and the shepherds of that day would have had a very hard life. They would have had very little grass, and they would have moved the sheep from field to field to try to get enough to keep them alive. So they would have to keep moving these sheep so they didn't run out of grass. In verse number 11, Jesus tells us that I am the good shepherd. So you understand that we know what shepherds do by and large. I have a name that obviously indicates that somewhere back in my uh, family tree, somebody was probably a shepherd. But we understand what they do. But in the days that the original readers would have been uh, hearing that, they really would have known what it meant when he says, I'm the good shepherd, because shepherds in that day would have been everywhere around. We know David was a, a shepherd boy. We know that that was very much a part of that culture in that region. Well, if you look back in verse number one of that same chapter, it talks about the sheepfold. Jesus says, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold. And the sheepfold, so I'm told by reading, was this enclosure. Sometimes they would use some natural barriers, maybe some rock cliffs or whatnot, or some hills. They would put this, uh, the, the natural barriers, and then they would include or, or conclude with that a stone wall around there. And they would make a place like a, a, we would call it a pen, or we would call it a corral. And so this sheepfold was where the shepherds would come from time to time, maybe, and some not all every night, but they would come and they would deposit their sheep into there. And for money, that people would watch that sheepfold. The person that would watch it's called the porter. And that porter would watch those sheep. And then in the morning, after the shepherd would go and have gotten rest a little bit, then he would come back up and pick up his sheep. But it's like we would go uh, in to drop our car off, get it serviced. Well, when they're done, we'll come back and we'll get it. Well, the sheepfold there is what Jesus is talking about. He says, if somebody climbeth up over those walls or over that uh, barrier, then he'd been a thief. And Jesus is using all of this to sell, tell about him being the good shepherd. I want you to see in verse number 10 that he is this giving shepherd. The thief cometh not for to do those things, but I am come that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. I'm looking at this giving shepherd. And as I was thinking about where the Lord would have us be today as we come together as a church family, I thought about this, that we ought to dwell on this aspect that Jesus is that giving shepherd, that those words rather more abundantly. It really means to the fullest measure be about like the trash that when you don't want to take it out, you want somebody else to take it down, out you shove it down in the, in, the, in, in the kitchen there just so your unsuspecting family member that comes says, wow, this needs taken out. You say, how do you know that? We've got three kids. and we, I know how that goes. Well, it's pushed down and just uh, to the fullest measure. And Jesus said, I'm come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. And I'm asking you this morning, if you're living a life that is less than that abundant life, Jesus said he was giving it. We're on the receiving end of it. So if there's a problem somewhere on the giver or the receiver, I'm going to have to go that it's not with God. But instead, it's you and me. If we're not having that abundant life, and you say, Pastor, John, you don't know all the things that I'm going through right now. Jesus didn't say He's going to give you that abundant life when everything was smooth. He says He's going to give that abundant life because that joy comes from the shepherd that gives it. He says, I give it even in the midst of troubles. And so we don't like being likened to farm animals, I know, but God knew us pretty well when He said we're like sheep. And those sheep that we are, God gives us a couple of things. He gives us protection. As oftentimes helpless animals, those sheep would stray away. Well, the shepherd would go and pull them back in. He gave them protection. But he not only did that, he gave them provision. I'm told that those sheep, I've never uh, worked with them. We've never had any of those. Dad had about every other animal it seemed like, but never any sheep. But I'm told that those sheep would eat all the grass off of an area, and if you didn't move them, that they would stay on that area, and they would keep on eating, keep on eating, keep on eating, even down to where they're getting into the dirt, and then disease issues came into be because they weren't getting the grass. Instead, they were getting the, uh, the, the dirt, which brought around uh, their different diseases that they might take in. And so the shepherd would be the one that not only protected them, but provided by leading them to some new pastures. And think about this giving shepherd, the one that gives us abundant life. And so many of the Christians I meet don't seem to have abundant life. Oh, you pin them down and say, yeah, I know Jesus. But they seem to be so miserable. 
And my friend, God did not intend for us to be that way. In the midst of your problems, in the midst of my issues, because of the Savior abiding with us, we can have that abundant life. But I see not only does He give that giving shepherd, or, but He's also that caring shepherd. Look down at verse 14. It's past where we read. But He says this, I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep. We have a shepherd that actually knows our name. There's that song that many of us enjoy that He knows my name. We enjoy that. When we were talking about that sheepfold a little bit ago, I didn't tell you the whole story. It's also very true. It's still happening today in different parts of the world. As those shepherds would deposit those sheep in the sheepfold, and they would maybe go get a night's sleep somewhere at their house or wherever they're at, and then they would come back the next day, and they would retrieve their deposit. Well, they don't have, didn't have brands in those days where they burned something into, their, uh, into them back there so they would know them. They didn't have ear tags like we put sometimes in livestock now. Very, very interesting. The shepherd would go into the sheepfold and he would call his sheep. And he would call them unto himself. And amazingly enough, the shepherd would know, the sheep rather, would know the voice of the shepherd. And as he called them out, oftentimes by name, but at least by his own voice and the inflections that he was normally using, then those sheep would hear him and they would come his direction. And that's what Jesus says in verse number 14. I know my, and I know my sheep and they are known of, my, uh, of mine. I'm the good shepherd and know my sheep. We'll get it right here in just a moment. But I see this caring shepherd. And I'm thinking about this. If God truly does know your name and he knows what we're going through, why is it that we get so depressed? And why is it that we get so upset about the things that are going on in my life as if God doesn't know the beginning from the end to tomorrow's? He's already there. And so when I walk through difficulties, I ought to be happy enough just to know that he knows my name. I was walking up to this group of preachers at a pastor's fellowship one time. I knew who they were because uh, of some social media presence, but I didn't think any of them knew who I was. So I was walking up to them. I was going to introduce myself to them. But as they turned to look at me, one of them said, Oh, Brother Herdman, it's good to have you here. I thought, Oh, I'm more impressive than I thought. (laughs) I hope I didn't think that. But it was certainly nice to hear my name. And my friend, we don't serve a God, a Savior, that just knows us all collectively and we're just one of the bunch. Instead, he says, that if you're his, you, he knows your name. He calls it out from time to time. I watch us here. It happens to me as well. And the Lord really calls your name in a church service and you'll stand up or you raise your hand and you don't even have a question. You just raise your hand praising the Lord. You say, thank God for that. God calls our name on certain things. Maybe it's a passage of Scripture you're reading. You've read it a thousand times, but you're reading it. It seems like you read it for the first time. It just seems to jump out at you. God calls your name. Maybe it's driving into church this morning. There's such beautiful weather around here and things are popping out. The the buds are coming out and green. Things are getting green and greener. And maybe it's just that you drove down the road and you saw some of the same landscape that you've been looking at all your life. But today it looked like you uh, were looking at it through fresh eyes. God calls our name. And I think about this Savior, not only is this giving shepherd, but he's this caring shepherd that calls us by name. And I'm so grateful that God knows who I am in the midst of this world of 8 billion plus people. God still knows that where we reside, he's that caring shepherd. But I want you to look at verse number 15. Not only is he those things, but he's also this sacrificing shepherd. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. We mentioned he's a giving shepherd, but the most important thing he gave was he gave us salvation. He's giving his sacrificing self to be put upon a cross and killed and buried and rose again. That's who he is. He didn't look down on you and see, wow, there's somebody worth saving down there. He didn't look down on me and say, wow, there's somebody worth saving down there. No, he out of his love came down and died for us because he loves us. He knows us. He's our shepherd. I read a story of George Tyson. He was a man that was always found with his, at the time, was 32-year-old son. His 32-year-old son was, took a fall at 18 months, so he'd been this way nearly all of his life, but he'd taken a fall and suffered brain damage. 
And so he would take his son, George Wood, and he would, everything he did, he was often seen walking around their neighborhood, their subdivision, and they were usually together. He was a carpenter, so oftentimes his son would uh, just be there with him. He's very docile, just stay over there and, and uh, on the job site. But Gary, his son, was inseparable from his dad. One night they were taking a walk in their area, and there was a teenage driver came speeding their way in his vehicle. Before he had time to think, that car was getting closer and closer, and George shoved his son, 32-year-old by this point, out of the way. He pushed him to safety, but the car hit George with full force. Shortly thereafter, he died. It was an amazing thing. Everybody in the community knew him. They all saw him. There was friends with him. And one of the people at his memorial service said this about George. He said, well, he died doing what he loved most. He was taking care of his son. And you know, our Savior died on the cross doing what he loved most. Providing salvation for us. My friend, I'm just so overwhelmed this morning that even though God knows, knew everything about me, He still loved me. And the Good Shepherd, Jesus Christ, the Good Shepherd, in verse number 11 of this passage, in Hebrews, He's the Great Shepherd. In 1 Peter chapter 5, He's the Chief Shepherd, but He's the Shepherd. Now, as I mentioned, I've never been around sheep. We've been around other animals. And so what I do know about them, at least from cows, what dad would do is they would, he would rent other pastures. But in the fall of the year when that pasture gets eaten down and they're needing to come back and you're going to have to feed them hay anyways, you want to be closer to the house so you can doctor them, so you can keep an eye on them, any of them have calves, you can take care of them, tend to them. And so I, I know what we always did was bring them back closer to the house. And I've talked to a lot of Christians that they seem to be in the fall of their lives as well. And by their testimonies, it seems like God is drawing them closer and closer to Himself so that He can keep better track of them. I've watched so many dear, wonderful saints of God as they get up older in years, and their walk with the Lord just seems to be so much more sweet. And I think that's God just bringing them closer to the house. So he can keep a better eye on them. Somebody asked me about my dad. Said, you think your dad will come down? I said, I doubt it. He'll just wait for me at the house to come up and see him. I'm thinking about this shepherd. I want to close with this story I read. This is a preacher telling this story. And he was talking to another preacher, or at least Bible teacher. But this other Bible teacher told of the highlands of Scotland, which is where he was from. And he said the sheep oftentimes would wander off in that area that we lived in and they would wander off into places that they couldn't get out of. He said in the highlands there, they would sometimes see some tender grass. And so he said that uh, the grass up in those mountains sometimes was very sweet and the sheep liked it. But they would wander off and they would sometimes go down 10 or 12 feet to a little spot where there was some grass that was evident. They would get down there, but then they couldn't get back up. And so this preacher told this other teacher that he said the, the shepherd, after the sheep ran out of the grass on that little spot that they went down there and they so loved it, that shepherd would wait. They would hear the bleeding of the sheep because the sheep were hungry by this point and they wouldn't be able to get to any other food. And he said the shepherd would wait until they got near faint and then they'd let themselves down on that little plateau, a little spot there. Tie a rope around the sheep and get back up the top and drag it up and then nurse it back to health. So the one preacher asked the other preacher, said, well, why don't they just jump down there or get down there when they first got there and not let them get so dangerously close to being ill? And he said in that nice accent that he had, he said, ah, oh, and he caught him. He said, that's the problem. He said the shepherd knew that if he came down there too soon in that sheep's health because of being scared of the shepherd and the commotion of getting down there, he would jump off that precipice to his death. And he said that that shepherd knew that he had to wait till that sheep got done fighting, got out of strength, so that he wouldn't pose any threat to his own self 
And then that shepherd would slip down and then pull that sheep back up to safety. The one preacher tells the other preacher, he says, that's the way it is with men. He said, God is ready to help at any time, but oftentimes when God moves in on our lives, we don't like the movement, so we jump to our own demise. And my friend, I thought that I should share with everybody this morning that you may be that sheep that you think you found such a good spot, but now the grass is gone. And you're crying out to God, God, why don't you come and get me? It could be the Lord is leading you there, leaving you there because He knows that's the safest place for you. And as soon as you quit thrashing, fighting, kicking, and screaming, then the Lord may very well just slip down and pull you back up to safety, nurse our wounds, and let us go on to feed in another pasture. My friend, we've got a wonderful shepherd. And perhaps you're here this morning and you've been living your life as a Christian, but you've been fighting and kicking against what he wanted you to do. Maybe it's time you just let the shepherd have his way with you. He came to give you life, and he came to give it more abundantly. We Christians are so good at messing things up. How many of you ever been in that spot where you just gave it all to God, but then as soon as God fixed it a little bit, you said, thanks God, I got it from here. Maybe you're that Christian that needs to say, Lord, you've got me. Or maybe you're here this morning and you've heard all of your life, much of it at least, about the Savior, the Shepherd, Jesus, the Lord is my Shepherd. You've heard about that. But you've tried everything in your life you could to get things figured out. Perhaps you're like that sheep that jumped down to that little spot of grass and it was good eating for a while. And you found that you had some good eating for a bit. But now the grass is gone. The water is non-existent. And you don't have any hope unless some shepherd comes and rescues you. My friend, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I would ask you to quit fighting, quit thrashing, Quit kicking and screaming. Let the Lord save your soul, the good shepherd. Whichever your spot is in today, if you're saved and you know the Lord, would you just leave out of this place thanking God for the good shepherd? But if you're here today and you've tried everything else, you've tried every bit of green grass that is known in your life, it only satisfied for a little while. My friend, that shepherd waits for you. He came to die on the cross for you and for me. He not only died, he was buried for three days and then he rose again in victory and he resides in heaven again. All for you and for me. My friend, if you'd just let loose a little bit and reach out to him, he'd save your soul. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. We, I helped for some time in Murfreesboro with the Good Shepherd Children's Home. No more fitting name for a children's home that helped children in such a rough spot in their life because they wanted to be known as a, the arm of the good shepherd. I've been to, heard of other churches that were the Good Shepherd Baptist Church just to remind people that we have a wonderful shepherd. That wonderful psalm that I alluded to in the beginning, the Lord is my shepherd. Is he your shepherd this morning? Wants to be your savior and your shepherd. I hope you would let him. Father, I pray that you'd bless us now. I ask you to make each one of us, dear Lord, more aware of what you want to do in our lives. Lord, some of us Christians, we fight and we'll resist the, the good things that you want to do seem strange now when I think about it, Lord. How many times we as Christians, we've just fought against the best thing going on in our lives. I can do it. Like a, like a little beginner age kid that you try to help because you know what to do. But then that kid that fights says, no, me, me do it. And then they make a mess of it. And then mom comes back 
and fixes what she could have fixed more easily the first time. Lord, help us just to give it all to You. And my Savior, I pray if there's somebody in this room who doesn't know You, I pray that today would be the time that they would receive You as their Savior and their Shepherd. Be saved. Thank You for what You're going to do in Jesus' name. If you're able to, would you stand together with me as the ladies play something through? As they begin to play, if God's speaking to your heart, I invite you to come. How about a Christian? Are you tired of running? Are you tired of trying to do it your own way? Are you tr- tired of trying to figure it all out on your own? Would you give it to Jesus this morning? Maybe you're here, you're not sure that you're saved. Not sure that you, you know about the Good Shepherd. Not sure that you know Him as your personal Savior. Would you step out and come? Let one of us take a Bible and show you how to be certain about that. This is no age to be living uncertain about your eternity. My friend, you need to have it nailed down. Settled. Knowing the Savior and knowing that the Savior knows you. Only trust Him. That's what they're playing. Only trust Him. Only trust Him now. As they play another verse, if God's speaking to your heart, I invite you to come. Is He calling your name? Brother Daniel's down here in the front. Would love to take a Bible and pray with you. Maybe you just need somebody to encourage you in the Lord. Then this altar is open for you. Come. Thank you so much. You may look this way. I'm going to ask Brother Archie Johnson, if you don't mind, Brother Archie, to come up and close us in prayer. We thank the Lord for the good breakfast yesterday that he headed up. And uh, Brother Eugene was cooking, had a great time, his family as well. But uh, we, we, we want to invite you. I forget the dates of the next one. We're going to do one later this fall, I believe it is. And we'll have a good time, the men, just to get to fellowship, pray a little bit together, have a challenge. But uh, thank you for being with us today. Again, next Sunday at 10, if you've got, uh, you'd like to come to that membership interest meeting. Amy and I will be back in the lobby and we'll give you that sign up sheet. There's also some VBS uh, sheets back there that you can take and fill out. We'd love to have you part of Vacation Bible School and uh, we'll have a good time tonight as well at church. Invite each of you back for that. Thank you so much for being in God's house. It's just a wonderful, wonderful place to be. And now we would thank the Lord if it wasn't Christina Searcy's 94th birthday, and if it was raining outside, and it was uh, just dreary, but my, oh my, as we get to celebrate somebody's birthday, as we get to come together, there's probably some other birthdays in here. Anybody else's birthday today? Looky there. See? I won't ask Nancy Hall, though, so I'm not not even going to do it. Praise the Lord. And there may be some anniversaries in here. Anybody's anniversary today? (laughs) Nancy, you can't get both on the same... Oh, my goodness. How come you chose your birthday, not Rick's birthday? So, Nancy's birthday today, this is also her anniversary. Huh? <laughs> Amen. Well, thank you so much for being in church this morning. What a joy just to get to be together. But I was going to say, with all these different events happening and this beautiful weather, we would still praise the Lord. Amen. But if we would praise the Lord in dreariness and praise the Lord without some special things going on, we certainly ought to praise the Lord when we got this beautiful day to run around in. Right. My goodness, uh, sometimes God is just, well, all the time, He's better to us than we deserve. Brother Archie, would you pray and dismiss us in prayer? Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming out to the prayer breakfast yesterday. Uh, it was an awesome time. You missed out if you weren't there. So I would plan on being at the next event uh, for the men. Let's pray. Dear Lord in heaven, 
We thank you so much for today. We thank you for the beautiful day. We thank you for each breath. We thank you for each heartbeat. We know it's on loan from you. I pray, Lord, that you go with us, Lord. Give us safety as we travel to our homes and to our places uh, that we go. And dear Lord Heaven, we thank you for the message, and we thank you for being the great shepherd. In Jesus' name, amen.